I'm here again with Ben Carpenter, who is the vice chairman of CRT Capital uh, and author of The Bigs. And Ben, really cannot thank you enough for uh, stopping by. Let's now focus on your book, The Bigs. And I'd love to talk to you about what inspired you to write it. Uh, I would recommend that anybody out there that's looking for a job or thinking about a career move or really wants to uh, rise through the ranks of management to read this book. It is phenomenal. But let's, let's talk a little bit about how you got the idea. Yeah, interestingly, it never occurred to me to write a book, but uh, my daughter, Avery, my oldest of, of three daughters, graduated from Vanderbilt University in 2011. Uh, like a lot of college kids, she hadn't done any work to get prepared for uh, life post-graduation. After a job search, she got a job offer to be the assistant to the co-executive producer of the Katie Couric Show. We're all excited, jumping up and down when Avery told us the news and that feeling of euphoria lasted until the next day when Avery sent Lee and I an email uh, titled, Is This Okay to Send? And it was addressed to her new boss, the co executive producer, saying, You know, thank you so much for the job, can't wait to work with you, but would you mind if I didn't start work on Monday? I'd rather start work a week from Monday because I have some loose ends to tie up. And when I read that email, I started pounding and it felt like my head was going to explode. And it wasn't because I was mad at Avery. I really wasn't mad at her. I was scared for it. I was scared because at that instant, I realized for the first time that my daughter, who's so intelligent, so engaging, and in some ways uh, sophisticated, had no idea about what the real world was about to demand of her. So I immediately sent her an email, do not send, more to follow. And then I sat down on my, on my phone and I typed out 22 bullet points of everything that I thought she needed to know if she was going to be able to survive and succeed in the real world. And as a testament to just how concerned I was and panicked at this moment, I didn't stop writing for the next 18 months. And the result is the book, The Bigs. Before we uh, get into the actual book, which again, everybody should read this book. It is truly fantastic. Uh, he has a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, which I think is incredibly uh, impactful, and i just like to read it. Um, Nothing in the world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, difficulty. I've never in my life envied a human being who led an easy life. I've envied a great many people who've led difficult lives and led them well. That's really the, the important thing to understand, that you can have a wonderful, valuable career that's very satisfying and supports your family and all the important things in life and you don't have to get to the top of their pyramid. If you do, that's great, but that's not the important thing and I think that's what Teddy Roosevelt was saying, which is it's not about winning, it's about competing. What drove you to um, work your way to the top? Oh, there's really one thing and it's really clear in my mind, which was fear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a great motivator uh, and it was fear of having a unsuccessful career like my father and having my family experience of sort of financial uh, difficulties that we, that we experienced. And uh, that's really what drove me and was really the source of, of my energy. And what I say to, you know, particularly college students when I'm out talking to them is that it doesn't really matter where your source of energy comes from. It's going to be different for different people. You know, if I had a different situation, you know, the energy might have come from wanting to emulate the success of my father and not wanting to let him down. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as something is driving you to be uh, the best you can. Yeah, and the other thing that you also did throughout your career was um, you, you, you dabbled in other things. I mean, you were an entrepreneur. You had a bar. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, when I graduated from Bowdoin College in 1980, uh, I came to New York to be a commercial banker at Bankers Trust Company. And one of the first things that happened to me, happily, was that I was asked to play on a softball team for a local bar. And uh, I remember where I was in this bar. It was a bar that was very popular with the wrong professionals, so it was always very busy. And I remember being back at the bar with my jersey on one night with a beer in hand. I remember where I was standing in the bar at the time, and a light bulb went off. And I said to myself, I could do this. I could, I could start a bar and get 
this crowd and even more people to come to it. I just needed a bar. And so those were the two things I didn't have. I didn't have a bar and I didn't have any money. But I did have an idea. And so the next day after work, came home from Bankers Trust, changed out of my suit and tie into jeans and sneakers, t-shirt, went walking around the neighborhood looking for a bar that wasn't very busy and was clearly struggling. And after about an hour, hour and a half walk around the neighborhood, the first bar I came outside of was a place called the Tumble Inn on 89th and 1st Avenue. And as I say in the book, it was the most rundown, forlorn looking bar on the Upper East Side. And it didn't get any better when I walked in. When I did walk in, there was two old guys falling off of bar stools and one old white haired lady behind the bar, probably about my age currently, but seemed ancient at the time, uh, realized that she, after many visits to the bar over the next few weeks, realized that she was the owner of the bar and that she had a long-term lease, another eight years left on her lease. And uh, I also realized that the first night that I was there wasn't an off night for the bar. She really had very little business going on. And so I proposed that we become partners. And uh, the proposition was that we'd first pay all the expenses of the bar, then we'd pay her, her name is Margie Bruno, we'd pay Margie a salary that was greater than what she was making currently, and after that we'd split everything 50-50. But the bar was a huge hit, and for those seven, eight years, it was one of the most popular and crazy bars in Manhattan. Yeah, without a doubt. I, I actually went there a couple times back, back, back in the day, uh, without a doubt. I had a great time. It was, it was absolutely awesome. Tell us a little bit more in terms of uh, some of the points that you would like to get across um, or that you're trying to convey in your book uh, to young people. I really think it's important that, that young people don't follow the traditional advice, which is to follow your passion. If your passion and what you're good at are one and the same, then go for it. But if what you think you'd like to do and what you might be passionate about is different than what you're good at, uh, the world is too competitive a place to try to make a living doing something that you enjoy but you're not particularly good at. The other piece uh, is how to get the job. And uh, we haven't talked about that yet. And I think the, the most critical thing that is either not understood or underappreciated is the importance of informational interviews. And when young people come to me for an informational interview, just to understand what the business is, of finance is about, the first thing I do is congratulate them for understanding that it's important. Then the next thing I do is ask them, how many interviews are they planning on going on? And the typical uh, informational interviews. And the typical response I get is five to 10. And I tell them they should be looking to do 40 or 50 informational interviews. Because if they do that, they'll get three things. One, they'll find out if the job is right for them. Two, they'll get practice in selling themselves for the job. And three, they will, what I call fishing, they'll have enough lines in the water to be able to hook and land a great job. And you can't do that unless you've had, you can't do those three things unless you really understand what the job is all about. And you get that from doing informational interviews. Uh, finally, I think on the how to do a great job, you know, there's so many different aspects of that. Uh, but I think the, the one that's most underappreciated by employees, junior and senior, is the importance of thinking like a CEO. And this is something that's not in my book that I do talk about when I'm out talking to students, is that uh, there's only two things that a CEO or an owner is trying to do every day. He's trying to lower expenses and raise revenues. That can be in the short term, intermediate term, or long term, but everything he's trying to do goes back to those two things. Understanding what the company as a whole is trying to accomplish and trying to contribute to that. When you're out talking to students, is there, what is the one thing that you think is the most important piece of advice you can give them? Yeah, the, the most, the single most important piece of advice in the bigs to me because of the value that I put on it is that happiness is a choice. And that's something that took me until I was 40 years old to understand. But once I did understand it, it really, it really changed my whole outlook. You know, I think that a lot of students think, well, I'm perfectly happy and I didn't come to hear Ben Carpenter talk about happiness and what I, I want to be successful in my job. 
And what I tell them is that there's nothing more important to your professional success than being able to raise your happiness. And that's because happiness is like a magnet. People want to work with and they want to work for happy people. And unhappiness is like a repellent. People don't want to work with you and they don't want to work for you. And so if there's one thing you can do to raise the success in your career, it's to raise your average level of happiness. Ben, that is awesome advice. Uh, again, I'm here today with Ben Carpenter, who's the vice chairman of CRT and author of The Bigs. Really, really appreciate you taking the time. Your advice is incredibly valuable, and I hope everybody reads your book. Skitty, thank you.